To keep your precious beer at optimal quality, there are a number of inexpensive and easy methods you can apply to act as insurance. Something that might not be necessary, but is handy to have just in case. We're going to look at three cheap and quick steps employed by members of the Brewlosophy crew to give their beers the best chance of staying fresh. I'm Martin Keane, and this is The Brewlosophy Show. Brewers have been taking steps to maintain the quality of their beers for centuries. From the early days of using spices and herbs to act as preservatives, through to refrigeration in beer storage today, brewers want to protect their beverage. Factors such as oxidation, microbial contamination, and variations in temperature can significantly degrade beer quality, which is why a little insurance, a small addition or modification to the brewing process, might be just what you need. These are things that add mere seconds to your brew day and cost pennies to implement. So let's take a look at three insurance methods and explore the science behind them. And let's start with metabisulfite. Sulfites are chemical compounds that are widely used as a preservative in the food and beverage industry. While most commonly used in wine as a means of inhibiting unwanted microbial activity, there's been increased interest in the positive impact sulfites can have on beer, particularly as it relates to reducing the risk of cold side oxidation. Now, all a brewer has to do is at packaging, dose the beer with one of two similar salts, either sodium metabisulfite, that's SMB, or potassium potassium metabisulfate, PMB. We've tried both in an experiment and found them to be indistinguishable. So go with what you have on hand. And chances are you already do have PMB, otherwise known as Camden tablets. You may well have been adding these to remove chlorine and chloramine in your brewing water, but to use this as an agent to prevent cold side oxidation, you'll want to add a crushed up tablet at packaging. Dosage rates vary, 10 parts per million is a good starting point, which for a five gallon batch is roughly half a candom tablet. So do metabisulfites really work to help prevent oxidation? Brewlosophy contributor K. Joe put this to the test, dosing SMB in a New England IPA. Kate brewed a 10 gallon batch, mashing, adding hops and yeast along the way. 12 days after brew day, Cade measured out 0.3 grams of SMB, yet that's all, and added it to one keg. He then split the batch of beer evenly between two kegs and waited for a week. Here's what the beers looked like a week later, with the no SMB beer clearly darker in color, exhibiting visual signs of possible oxidation. Three weeks after packaging, Cade served the beers to tasters. Each participant was served two samples of the beer packaged with SMB and one sample of the beer packaged without SMB in different colored opaque cups, then asked to identify the unique sample. A total of 17 tasters would have had to accurately identify that sample in order to reach statistical significance, which is exactly how many did, indicating participants in this experiment were able to reliably distinguish a New England IPA packaged with SMB from one packaged without SMB. In this instance at least, metabisulfite made a notable difference. Something else you might be using at the start of your brew day that can also be useful later in the process is lactic acid. Now, brewers typically use lactic acid to acidify their mash to ensure it falls within the range of 5.2 to 5.6 pH to promote proper conversion during the mash rest. And post boil, that's typically the pH range that the wort stays at. But given that dry hopping tends to increase the pH of beer, a growing number of IPA brewers have begun adding acid to wort following the boil. And that's as a way to avoid flabby or other unpleasant characteristics. Lowering the pH of wort to around 5 or lower can bring out brighter characteristics in the beer. In fact, Brewlosophy contributor Jordan Folks performs a post-boil acidification on almost every brew he makes, regardless if dry hops were used. He put this to the test with an American IPA. Now, after a brew day, his wort was at a pH of 5.28. Jordan split the wort between two kegs, adding two milliliters of 88% lactic acid into one keg, bringing its pH down to 4.99. After fermentation and dry hopping, the adjusted batch was at 4.09 pH, and the unadjusted batch was at 4.21 pH. 
The beers were served to tasters in a triangle test. Now, 10 tasters were needed to identify the unique sample for statistical significance. And again, that is exactly the number that did. Interestingly though, preference was split 50-50 between the two batches, but the difference was observable. Post-boil pH adjustment is certainly something to consider. And something I'm considering using is Brutan B. Brutan B, a food grade tannic acid, is purported to increase clarity, extend freshness, and promote shelf stability. It works by binding to proteins and polyphenols, which then become larger and heavier and drop out of solution. It's also an effective antioxidant, which can prevent the oxidation effect in beer. It can be added to both the mash and the boil. Dosage rates on the packaged I purchased are incredibly small. For a five gallon batch, add around 1.5 grams in the mash and another one gram into the boil. Clearly my 28 gram package will be sufficient for a lot of brew days, but fortunately it does have a shelf life of around five years. Now, Brewlosophy contributor Matt Dalfiaco put Brutan B to the test with an American Pale Ale. Matt brewed two identical batches side by side, adding about one gram of Brutan B into the mash of one batch and an additional one gram with five minutes left in the boil. After fermentation, the beers were transferred to a keg and burst carbonated. While Brutan B is said to increase beer clarity, both beers maintained a slight haze. The beers were then served to tasters. Each participant was served two samples of the Brutan B beer and one sample of the standard beer, then asked to identify the sample that was unique. 14 tasters would have had to select the unique sample in order to reach statistical significance. And yeah, guess what? Once again, exactly that number were the ones that made the correct selection. Now there is an interesting caveat to this one. Matt kept these beers for a further six months and served them up for a second round of data collection. Now, was there a difference after six months? Well, the Brutan B beer had fallen a little clearer in this time. And in the second triangle test, 12 tasters would have to select the unique sample in order to reach statistical significance. But this time, only eight people were correct. So, mixed results here. And, and that's really the crux of insurance. It's simple, it's cheap, and it's easy. And it just might have a positive impact or Maybe it won't, but all three methods seem to fall into the positive category in a cost benefit analysis. So how about you? Are you adopting any of these methods or do you have your own forms of insurance? Let me know in the comments. That's it. I'll be back next week with another episode. And in the meantime, think beer. <laughs>